John Bell is a former Royal Air Force pilot, retired Air Vice Marshal and Sky News military analyst. Welcome to our program, Sean. Hey, it's lovely. Thank you for having me, Daniel. North Korean special forces are moving closer to the border with Ukraine, according to the Pentagon. Meanwhile, North Korea has launched another intercontinental ballistic missile. Uh, does this bring the world closer to a global conflict than ever before? I'm not sure it brings the world closer, but there are lots and lots of lessons to be learned from this. First of all, um, President Putin clearly is struggling with manpower. He clearly um, wants to avoid another round of mobilization. He has used mercenaries, he's used Wagner Group, he's used prisoners, and now he's trying to get North Koreans uh, to be involved in the fighting. I think that all shows that it's not going all Russia's way at the moment. Um, it's one thing as a military guy to have special forces, or maybe there's reports up to 12,000 North Korean fighters, but they won't have any battle experience. They will have significant language issues. There's already reports that the uh, Russian soldiers don't know what to do with them. And the grave danger is they're simply used as cannon fodder that they um, sacrifice their lives. I think what's more worrying is that are they volunteers or are they pressed men? And there are reports in North Korea that their families are being rounded up to make sure that they um, do return home or die. In other words, that they don't try and run away um, and seek sanctuary whilst they're outside North Korea. So it's quite a complicated picture, I think. It'll also be interesting whether they used on the front line in Ukraine or reports suggest at the moment that they're focused on um, pushing Ukrainian forces out of Russia, out of the Kursk region. Uh, what can North Korean troops face in Ukraine? Well, you're probably better placed to answer that than I can. Um, I think what's been, um, from a Western military perspective, is that Russia has just been doing a grinding war of attrition. It is quite happy to lose thousands upon thousands of soldiers. Reports suggest up to a thousand casualties each day but they are making progress. The problem with that approach by Russia is that you need lots and lots of soldiers and another 12,000 soldiers from uh, North Korea just helps that. And I suspect, therefore, that they will probably be meet their end on the battlefields uh, in Ukraine. I think more worrying when you talked about the implications for global security, I think the worry there is North Korea has been isolated by the international community. Sanctions stop it prospering. But of course, uh, Russia desperately needs ammunition and people. And North Korea desperately needs money and technology. And it looks like Russia is paying a lot of money and providing technology to North Korea. That will embolden North Korea. That could make life even more difficult and more unstable for the international community. How can you assess the quality of those North Korean troops deployed to Russia and Ukraine? What do you make of their combat readiness? Well, it's a great question. Um, one of the challenges is that North Korea will not have any combat experience, but um, and we can only um, guess as to what sort of military training they're getting. Um, but the big challenge, of course, is communication. Um, my own experience of many decades of conflict is that your soldiers, it's all about morale. It's not just about carrying a gun. It's also your motivation to fight. And if you don't have, if you don't understand the orders that you're being given, if you're there against your best wishes, then you're not going to be well motivated to fight. North Korea has no motivation to support Russia. The only motivation is at the political leadership. And it's very difficult to order somebody to their death to serve in another country. So it's not entirely clear how this is going to work. If it's simply to throw more bodies at Ukrainian 
machine guns, then they will not last very long. But it is, at the moment, in a war of attrition, numbers mean something. And an extra 12,000 soldiers will be a bit more of a headache for the Ukrainian forces. Uh, from your perspective, how many soldiers Russia uh, needs to dramatically change the course of this war? I mean, from the North Korea. And do you feel that Kim Jong-un is ready to commit even more cannon fodder to the Russia's war effort? My um, So there's two parts, I think, to that question. Um, I have a number of contacts still uh, in the uh, military organizations and academia, and nearly all of them believe that neither Ukraine nor Russia has sufficient resources to do any form of breakthrough um, so it's a bit like holes in the dam. You know, there may be lots of holes, but is the dam going to fall through? Is Ukrainian defensive line going to collapse? And the answer appears to be no. Um, what would change that from a Russian perspective? What would they need to do? Um, now, one of the things they need to do is uh, a lot more soldiers, but soldiers alone won't solve the problem. And they also need a lot more tanks. Um, the Russians, by all accounts, have lost well over 3,000 of their most modern battle tanks. They've got loads in reserve, but they're old Second World War tanks, which still drive around the battlefield, but don't actually provide much protection and are not very effective at firing. So modern warfare is not just about soldiers on the ground. So North Korea, unless it starts providing um, other armaments like tanks and missiles, I think it's very unlikely that North Korea is going to make a significant difference. But North Korea undoubtedly wants to appear to help Russia so that it gets help with its own programs, not least of which its nuclear programs and its ballistic missile programs. Also, we have seen some interesting reports from the South China Morning Post, a group of nearly 200 North Korean defectors living in South Korea is pushing to deploy to Ukraine to launch a psychological warfare campaign against their former colleagues in the North Korean army. What does it mean? The trouble is with those stories, um, I, I'm never really keen to comment on those because, Daniel, we don't know very much about them. Um, we live in a world now where social media uh, is full of stories, not many of which are often true. And as a military analyst, I try to work on facts rather than uh, conspiracy theories. I think it's an interesting story. Um, you know, there are undoubtedly a lot of people in North Korea that want to escape. But whether or not they go across to Ukraine, whether they make a difference, I think it's 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 not a story. I think I can offer much of value to commentate on it. Uh, also, we have seen a reports about the possible response from the South Korean government. Uh, uh, there have been security meetings and uh, there are some expectations that uh, South Korea could respond by providing Ukraine some uh, military aid. What kind of weapons South Korea uh, could provide Ukraine uh, which, which would be needed for the Ukraine's war effort? Yeah, that's an interesting one, isn't it? I, I, if um, The danger here is that uh, South Korea is very concerned that North Korea is gaining money and gaining technology from Russia. That changes the balance of power between North Korea and South Korea. And that's why South Korea is very concerned about it. What can South Korea do? Well, one of the things they've talked about is to potentially help Ukraine with weapons. But bluntly, you know, there is a very limited amount that South Korea can do. Much more of this is apply, trying to apply political pressure because an emboldened North Korea, a strengthened North Korea, a North Korea that has the Russians helping it militarily would present a real threat to South Korea. And therefore, they want to do everything possible to stop it. But it, what it does raise is at the moment, this has been a fight between Russia and Ukraine. The West has provided lots of 
weapons um, and support to Ukraine, but has not provided boots on the ground, soldiers to support. If North Korea is actively involved in this war, then North Korea now becomes a combatant. And that means that they are a legitimate target is part of this war. And that opens up the war quite significantly. And I suspect that South Korea might be uh, incentivized to raise that prospect because it would... uh, Therefore, the international community could end up punishing North Korea for getting actively involved in the war against Ukraine. Does it mean that a uh, possible possibility of the gr- uh, boots on the ground is more likely in case of the North Korean involvement in the ground war in Ukraine? Also, uh, you also said something like this uh, on Times Radio about the possibility of, of a no-fly zone in case of a North Korean deployment. Uh, to Ukraine, uh, in which case an off-line zone or boots on the ground could be considered by the West uh, seriously? It's uh, one of the reasons that um, I'm constantly looking at what next is that if you look back nearly a thousand days now, when Russia first invaded, um, Ukraine is not a member of NATO. The West was therefore reluctant to get involved in a direct conflict with Russia. But over the last two and a half years, the West has provided anti-tank weapons. Then it provided tanks. Then it provided long-range missiles. Then it started to provide F-16 fighter jets. And gradually, the West has become emboldened to provide more and more support to Ukraine. But that so far, the bottom line has not to be putting boots on the ground. Now, I'm not sure boots on the ground will be um, appetizing for NATO, but there are several European countries, uh, France particularly, who have never written anything out. And therefore, getting closer to the point at which the West would consider committing boots on the ground, I think we're getting closer. I don't think we're there yet. But one idea about the no-fly zone, when we don't have time to talk about the whole prospects of a no-fly zone, but first of all, if the West was to impose one, Russia wouldn't stand a chance. They have struggled to maintain air supremacy over Ukraine against what, uh, you know, Ukraine has fought bravely, but it doesn't have many modern fighters or radars or missiles to combat the Russians, whereas the West would. The challenge, of course, is that to impose that no-fly zone, the West would have to target radars and missile systems on Russian soil, and that would extend the war. Now, if you were to have a no-fly zone that simply extended over the western half of Ukraine, in other words, no suggestion of having to take out radars or missile systems in Russia, that might be another step forward and might be another way of helping Ukraine. I'm not suggesting we're there yet, but all of a sudden those conversations are now much more uh, relevant and are starting to gain a degree of traction, certainly around some elements of Western community. Does it mean that a no-fly zone over Ukraine could, could help Ukraine to prevail uh, in the war against Russia? Because you, you just said that Russian... Russia will, will, will not be able to sustain air superiority in Ukraine uh, in case of uh, Western no-fly zone. I, I am very confident, Daniel, that if the West decided to put in a no-fly zone over the whole of Ukraine, that would be a major game changer for the war. If you look back in history, uh, ever since the advent of air power, Uh, It's been very difficult for any side to prevail if they don't have control of the air. One of the very difficult things that Ukraine has found, particularly on the front line, is the Russians using glide bombs, using air power, and it's very difficult, therefore, to operate on the ground when you have that sort of threat. With Western air power over the top of uh, Ukraine, I'm very confident that Russia would not be able to take a step further forward and would find it very difficult to continue the war. Almost certainly, that will be the major addition that would complement Ukraine's amazingly brave fighting community and could drive Russia out. The question is, though, I don't think the West has got any appetite to do that yet. The question is, um, if Russia continues to move forward on the battlefields, which it is at the moment, 
would the West be uh, content to sit back if Russia was to win, whatever that means? And I suspect that would prevent, uh, make some very difficult choices for some Western politicians. And it might be that things like a no-fly zone become back on the table again. Uh, do you feel that this uh, possibility of a no-fly zone over Ukraine could uh, deter Vladimir Putin from uh, deploying even more North Korean troops? Could uh, force Putin and Kim Jong-un to uh, change their calculus and to uh, try to not to deploy more North Korean troops to Russia and Ukraine? Daniel, I think it's much more powerful than that. I don't think this uh, uh, the, the North Korean troops would pale into insignificance. From the very start of the war, uh, President Putin is not stupid. His military would have known that if the West was to get involved, the, the Russia would be involved in a war that it could not win in Ukraine. Militarily, Russia is absolutely no match for NATO or the West, full stop. And it's been so badly degraded by an amazing Ukrainian defense that if the, if the Putin knows that if the West was to step in, he would have lost. That is why President Putin has been saber rattling, threatening the West with escalation, with nuclear conflict every step of the way whether it was starting to provide those anti-tank guns or tanks or long-range missiles, he's constantly threatened. And that has worked. The West has been scared. But gradually, the West has been emboldened. And the reason that Putin has done that, because he knows that it will be the end of the war if the West was to get directly involved. So I have no doubt at all in my mind that a, uh, a robust uh, Western no-fly zone over the whole of Ukraine would be a game changer. The problem is at the moment there's no appetite because, as we've said, of the West getting directly involved in this conflict. And at the moment, I don't see any movement in that. But there is the potential to do a no-fly zone over the west of the country, which might ease some of the concerns of the West, but also provide some support to Ukraine. Don't you think that it could be more appropriate to, to establish a no-fly zone rather than providing a billions in aid for Ukraine, which uh, now uh, has not changed the game? I, I agree. Um, but this is not my decision, Daniel. Um, you know, Western leaders, uh, as you will be well aware, um, one of the reasons I agreed to do these interviews, one of the reasons I went to Ukraine, was because I don't expect Ukraine is going to be happy with the decisions of the West, but it's, it's trying to explain why the West is walking the way it is walking. And the West at the moment does not want to end up precipitating a world war with Russia. Now, if I was in Ukraine and I was in your shoes, I'd be looking at every possible way to bring this war to an end and to defeat Putin. And that is a way of doing it. But at the moment, the prospects of putting boots on the ground, of escalating this conflict beyond the shores of Ukraine, that has significant implications for the West and NATO. And at the moment, our leaders are not comfortable doing that. The irony, of course, is that now that Putin has reached out and said, OK, he's been taking missiles and ammunition from Iran and from North Korea, now he's taking combatants from North Korea, then he could not turn around to the West and threaten an escalation because he's started using combatants. That's why I think it's an interesting conversation in the West. One of the problems, as you well know, though, Daniel, at the moment, is we're on the cusp of a U.S. election. We're not going to see any movement politically from the U.S. until after that election result and the new administration is in. And we hold our breath to see uh, who ends up leading the most powerful nation in the world after those elections. Uh, do you expect any kind of change in this matter of the possibility of no-fly zone, boots on the ground and uh, any other more serious options to help Ukraine after the US general election? Again, um, I think I the danger is I start to say yes or no to that sort of question. And the danger is, I think it's about trends. You'll excuse me, Daniel, but I've got grey hair. I've been around a few years. This isn't about yes or no, black or white. It's about where the trend is. And I think the trend is that um, the West has 
largely run out of military equipment to provide Ukraine. The danger is, therefore, we end up providing artillery shells and bullets. That drags Ukraine into a, a, a war of attrition, which is not the way that Ukraine needs to fight this war if it is to prevail. The West knows that it can be involved to prevail, but that carries huge risk. And it becomes a calculus of whether or not the West is prepared. What happens if President Putin dis- declares success and the West has done less than it might have done to stop it? And emboldened Putin might then decide that he wants to go further. What message does that send to China's Qing, uh, Xi Jinping? What message does that send to Iran and other uh, countries that think that um, using force might actually bring benefit. I think there's all sorts of questions, but the new administration in America, at the moment, they're only focused on the election. We'll have to wait probably until the new year before the new administration settles down and decides actually what it wants to do. And it also depends on how far Russia manages to get. And let's not forget, I've not seen the details of President Zelensky's victory plan, uh, which many of us were dying to see what what was in that plan. But we've not seen that either. So President Zelensky's clearly got some ideas as well, but will clearly need to work with Western leaders to bring those to fruition. What would happen if the West failed to appropriately respond to North Korean deployment to Ukraine? What would happen if they failed to deter further deployment of uh, manpower from North Korea to Russia? Well, I think, yeah, it's it's a difficult one because I'm not convinced that uh, the uh, flow of North Korean soldiers will be a positive long-term impact for Russia. I think there are all sorts of issues that could come back to bright bite President uh, Putin. And therefore, I, I'm I'm somewhat cautious about trying to look at a scenario where, it rather than ten thousand, it becomes a million soldiers. Um, if because and also I'm not aware of what Western leaders are saying um, behind the scenes. Because in this country, we've only recently had a general election. Yesterday, we had a budget. It's not entirely clear what um, this government's uh, feeling is about. Uh, the long-term prospects of the war. They're very supportive of, of of Ukraine. They've said that the support will continue to endure, but that's support financially and militarily. It's not necessarily talking about how do you up the game? Are there other ways in which we can respond as the war on the ground uh, changes? I think the answer to those questions won't come until early next year. And in a way, I suspect... Um, we've always anticipated that Putin is probably pushing as hard as he possibly can before the winter settles in uh, in Ukraine on the expectation or the hope that the change of administration in America means that America is less keen on supporting Ukraine and therefore President Putin will see an opportunity to negotiate and therefore win. And I think that's deeply troubling. Also, the New York Times reported some secret details about President Zelensky's victory plan. According to the American journalist, President Zelensky asked the United States to provide Ukraine with long-range Tomahawk missiles uh, as a part of a non-nuclear deterrence package. Would these missiles, Tomahawk missiles, be useful for Ukraine? My first question and the second one, is it a real option? I think any any weapons have, have to be a real option. I think what's interesting, Daniel, though, when we talk about weapons is that there's been a lot of conversation about um, giving Ukraine longer range missiles. Um, uh, we, there's been talk about attackums and about Storm Shadow, um, and the, the debate becomes whether they can be used against Russian targets on Russian soil. Now, the most of the West, the UK, said that as long as these weapons were used within the limits of the law of armed conflict, they were happy that they could be used. America was a little bit less comfortable, particularly after Ukraine had managed to invade Russia 
with the Kursk invasion. But there's a wider issue here, I think. Uh, in a way, some of these debates are a bit of a smokescreen because um, what Ukraine has been very, very effective at doing is developing its own long-range drones. Not much has talked about it and there's understandable secrecy around it. But President Zelensky was very clear that he wanted to uh, develop a million drones a year by uh, Ukraine's own industrial base. And whilst that sounds as if Ukraine has to do it itself, I'm pretty confident the West is already providing a lot of the elements of those long range drones, the engines, the wings, the sensors uh, and and the uh, the munitions themselves. So Ukraine is very quickly bolting this stuff together, testing it. And events over the last few weeks and months have demonstrated that Ukraine has become remarkably effective at conducting long range strikes using its own weapons. So whilst I have no doubt that um, getting extra weapons from the West will be valuable, uh, let's not forget Ukraine is also doing an amazing job of inventing its own capability with the support of the West. President Zelensky is confident that Ukraine should be a member of NATO or should get its own nuclear deterrent to deter any kind of a future attack by Russia. Is he right? When the war is over, um, the, the the debate then is how on earth to ensure Ukrainian security. Um, I One thing I was surprised about when I came out to Ukraine was that as a student of history, I can read about the Budapest memo of 1994, you know, at the fall of the Soviet Union, Ukraine was the third largest nuclear power, didn't have the launch codes, but would eventually uh, manage to get them. And uh, the Budapest memo, in effect, said, right, America, um, the UK, Russia, Ukraine, sit round, guarantee of your sovereign integrity if you give up your nuclear weapons. Now, 20 years later, Putin marches into Crimea, you know, 30 years later, he's marching into Ukraine. And I think there's some interesting questions that raises. Many of the Ukrainians that I met were very grateful to the West for the support they're providing in this war, but were also somewhat um, angry in a way that the Budapest memo hadn't been reinforced. Where was that guarantee of security? Where was the West stepping in um, to provide that security? And I, I guess my point is that it's all very well having a signed bit of paper, but how do you ensure your sovereign integrity, your territorial integrity, when it's pretty clear that Russia has spent 300 years waging a war against Ukraine. It's not about to stop just because a Western politician gets them to sign a bit of paper. Now, NATO is one way of doing that. Um, there are lots of other ways of doing it, bilateral or trilateral defence agreements. I think that the issue about NATO is that it's not just a question of come and join NATO. Uh, NATO is a, a club of which everybody has to contribute, everybody benefits. And, it's, and uh, there are also certain ground rules, as there are with the European Union. And finally, the other worry there, of course, is that eventually some form of peace has to be negotiated. If uh, Ukraine being part of NATO is a certainty of the future, it's quite possible that President Putin would not wish to seek to stop the conflict because he wouldn't want NATO on his door. So I do think there may be other ways in which the West can guarantee security for Ukraine without necessarily being a member of NATO in the near term. But again, that's not for me to discuss. That's for Western leaders to try to uh, work out how. At the bottom line is, whatever happens, Ukrainian sovereign integrity has to be protected by more than just a signature on a bit of paper. There are lots of reports about the possibility of negotiations between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, lots of ideas about uh, Ukraine's membership in NATO or other security guarantees in exchange of a ceasefire. Uh, with Russia, Financial Times reported about uh, Donald Trump's plan to end the war in Ukraine by freezing the conflict, uh, creating a demil demilitarized zone and just freezing all hostilities there. What do you make of these plans and uh, do you see any kind of a uh, a great scenario for for the ga end, end game scenario for Ukraine, uh, which could consist of uh, negotiating as some kind of this 
settlement with NATO membership ceasefire and like this. Daniel, one, one of the most difficult questions I get asked is this question, because the bottom line is that it's not my call, it's not the West's call, it's President Zelensky and the Ukrainian people's call about how you how you end this war. And, and, it, and, and understandably, that has to be a Ukrainian decision. So I, I all I can do is offer a perspective, but it's absolutely Ukraine's uh, option. It's President Zelensky to decide how he sees. Now, uh, if you look at this from a purely military perspective, you know, how will Ukraine prevail? What does winning look like? Uh, if that is pushing Russia out of Crimea and out of uh, Ukraine, at the moment, that looks a very, very difficult challenge to achieve. Um, and it's I, 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 I engaged with a lot of Ukrainian people when I was across in my visit. Um, and I expected there to be a um, yes, we'll win. It's just a matter of time. But now they felt much more the the price that Ukraine has paid, the number of people that have been sacrificed, um, the length of the war enduring. And I I sensed a degree more of um, will, will winning, will be able to get rid of Russia completely. Is that something that is achievable? And of course it is achievable, but I think the, the prospects for that are looking more and more bleak. The other end of the spectrum is, could Russia walk and take the whole of Ukraine? Um, again, that looks incredibly unlikely. They've paid a very high price so far, and they've run out of steam. So the question then becomes, pragmatically, do you A, continue the war, uh, continue more bloodshed? Uh, I noticed that Ukraine is already mobilizing another 160,000 people. Uh, and when I was walking around Kyiv, uh, it's a beautiful city. Uh, it was in beautiful sunshine, but it was very obvious there were not many fighting age men on the streets. There have been a lot of people taken away to the front. Ukraine is paying a huge price for this war. You know, is there a prospect that um, a negotiated settlement might bring the war to an end? Where I'm most uncomfortable with that is that any negotiated solution would probably see President Putin retaining some of the Ukrainian territory around the Donbass and potentially uh, Crimea. That would reward aggression, and I think that sends a profoundly dangerous message around the world. Um, but ultimately, this is President Zelensky's call. Is he prepared to continue the fighting? Uh, the West will continue to do what it can to support but, you know, we've already seen we're running short of weapons, but financial support will probably continue. But it will have pay a, a continuing high price for your uh, young men and women in Ukraine. And as long as Ukraine believes that's a price worth paying, then that President Zelensky will continue the war. And my last question will be about your visit to Ukraine. What did impress you the most during your trip to our country and to our capital? Well, I visited two places. Uh, uh, I went to Lviv to visit superhumans. Um, I found that incredibly humbling. I spent two years serving in Afghanistan. Our own military lost a lot of people to um, ha losing legs, amputees. And Ukraine is suffering many times more than that. And chatting to some of your wounded uh, service personnel, I raised £10,000 before I came out. And it was humbling to meet the soldiers, to give them a hug. Um, and I'm doing other things now to support them long term. The second part of my visit was to come to Kyiv. And I think many in this country, in the UK, thought that Kyiv would be like how London was in the Blitz. In fact, I went out for a walk. Uh, it was a beautiful sunny day, my first day there. The sunshine was beaming. The crowds were out and it was just a beautiful city. But there's three things, one of which not many fighting aged men. Second one in Maidan Square, the Russian tanks, the burnt out wrecks were just a reminder. But the most poignant thing which left an indelible mark on my head was I visited the uh, the battlefields of France and seen the cemeteries there. And it's incredibly moving seeing so many soldiers laid to rest in the corner of Maidan Square where you had the flags, the Ukrainian flags 
packed together in a very tight area, blowing in the breeze, each of them with the name of a fallen soldier. And there weren't a hundred, there weren't a thousand, there weren't 10,000, there were tens of thousands of those flags. And I spent about half an hour just sat walking around. Uh, it, I just found it incredibly poignant to see the, the full impact. And I just think it's amazing resilience of Ukrainians. Uh, it was incredibly motivating that I wanted to do, play my part to help. Um, but it was very humbling as well to see the massive price that's being paid for this, uh, for Putin's aggression, invasion of Ukraine. Thank you, Sean, for your support uh, for Ukraine and for your time for doing it today with us, for participating in our interview and uh, glory to Ukraine. Glory to Ukraine. Heroim Slav, thank you very much.